Be ye merciful, as your Father also is merciful. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Last Sunday, we learned of humility, the virtue that allows us to admit to ourselves and to others the reality of who and what we are, and to act in accordance with that reality. If I am a sinner, for example, humility allows me to admit that this is true, and it will also let me act accordingly. It will allow me to repent and to pray for the grace to amend. On the other hand, if I have done anything good, anything worthwhile, humility will allow me to recognize the truth that whatever good I have done has been nothing other than God's work in me. So humility will lead me to thanksgiving, to God for the gifts of his grace, and prayer for the grace to do well in future. Humility doesn't take for granted that one good deed will result in another, nor does it become self-confident. Humility allows us to place our confidence in God alone. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, as we were told last week, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Humility, that is to say, recognizes that we are creatures and therefore dependent on our Creator. We have no capacity to create ourselves, for God created us out of absolute non-being. But no more do we have the power to remake ourselves when we have tarnished the divine likeness in us by sinning against the truth. But we can rely on God's providential care for us, who, like the shepherd whose sheep goes astray, leaves the other ninety and nine and finds the one who is lost and carries it home upon his shoulders. In the Incarnation, this is precisely what Jesus has done for us. Remaining our shepherd, the shepherd, remember, is a symbol of divine providence, the divine Son of God seeks us by coming to where we are, and he lifts us upon his shoulders, he engrafts us into his sacred humanity, and in returning to his Father in our humanity, he draws us home to be with him where he is. So we must learn humility. We must learn to recognize reality for what it is, and learn to act accordingly, and not as though reality were other than it. This week we move on to a new lesson, but one which builds upon last week's lesson of humility, and that is the lesson of mercy. Now mercy is a very difficult thing to learn, because it involves learning to love even our enemies, those who have harmed us. The natural reaction to being sinned against, that is to say the reaction of the passions, is anger. But to allow ourselves to be led by anger is to skew our sense of reality. Anyone who hates another becomes the enemy of his own soul, says St. Augustine. For in raging against another, he has lost the power of discretion. When we act according to irrational passion, and especially when we allow our reason to be conformed to that passion, we lose our power of discretion our ability to discern the truth, the truth that our neighbor is made according to the image and likeness of God, just as we are, and that we must therefore act towards them out of love and not out of a desire for revenge. We must cast out the beam of hatred from our eye before we attempt to correct another's faults, before we try to remove the moat, the speck, in their eye. Humility recognizes both our dependence upon God and the reasonableness of trusting in Him, and also recognizes the fundamental equality between ourselves and our neighbors, in spite of what they may have done 
to us or to anyone else. Humility is the necessary precondition for mercy, for the letting go of wrath. And until we become merciful, our humility is not yet perfected in us. Learning mercy is a hard lesson. It is terribly hard to let go of injuries and to learn to correct others, not out of a desire for revenge, but from love for them and for God who made them. But it is a lesson that we must learn if we are to live the Christian life in more than just an abstract sense. To learn mercy is hard. But there is encouragement in St. Paul's first word to us this morning. I reckon, he says, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed unto us. That glory that is to be revealed in us is nothing less than the life of Jesus in all his divine perfections lived in us and through us. And it is that same Jesus who imitates his Father in all things, who is the one who bids us be merciful, even as thy Father, his Father and ours, even as he is merciful. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown within ourselves, waiting for the full adoption of sons, even the redemption of our body. We wait for, we hope for, we desire with all our being, whether we know it or not, for God to be all in us, even as he shall be all in all things. That is the earnest expectation of the whole creation, for God to be all in all. By his Holy Spirit, our Lord is bringing this new creation to birth in us, in humility and mercy whereby he lives in and through us to the glory of his Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.